I think what PFL offers is, you know, especially for the fighters involved in the regular season at the start of the year, they know that if they keep winning, they've got three fights that year, they've got $100,000 to win at the end of it, and they'll be the European champion. And that potentially opens the door for them to move on to the global roster where, you know, they can they can get in that million dollar striking distance. It, it, it's a quick and easy path to, to making proper money in, in, in MMA, which has always been a rare thing. Um, and I think offering that money gives people a different opportunity and an option, which is going to, across the sport, push all the purses up, which I think is, is additionally beneficial. I mean, you know, you can imagine if you're a, a budding heavyweight and you're looking at the options, you know, Ngannou's opponent's going to get $2 million. You're, going, you're starting to think of your options now. It's, uh, it, it changes the market slightly, in my opinion. Hello everyone and welcome back to a brand new episode of Smack Talk with Sandu. I'm so excited to be speaking to my guest today. I haven't actually spoken to him or caught up with him in quite some time. He's an analyst, a commentator, a coach, head of fighter operations for PFL Europe. He's a man that wears many hats. He is Dan the Outlaw Hardy. Dan, my man, how are you doing? I'm good, my friend. Very busy as you've just alluded to. Uh, yes. trying to keep up with everything but en enjoying the process i love it yes we have a lot to talk about you are like i said a man that wears many hats but where i'd like to begin is typically every time i've spoken to you over the years i always start with how's how's your health you know like it's been 10 years since you were first diagnosed with wolf parkinson white syndrome and it's obviously something that impacted your your fight career and it's been a decade and I know you were medically cleared in 2018, but just generally living with it, your health, how are you feeling at 41 years of age? Yeah, I'm feeling great, to be honest. I'm I'm, I'm tip top. Uh, you know, I, I could maybe lose a couple of pounds around, uh, you know, around the midsection, but I am 41 now. But yeah, I'm still good. I'm, I'm still healthy, moving well. Um, no problems at all with my heart, with my health. Um, everything's good. So uh, yeah, just trying to, Trying to get myself back on a health track and uh, but get back in shape now. It's crazy to think like it's been ten years, and you were in the, in the prime of your fighting career. Uh, to 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 have to kind of look back, you know, on that period of your life, you know, ten ten years ago. At what point did you kind of say to yourself, "Okay, this is my new normal. I need to now start to figure out what else I can do, how else I can contribute to the industry, and also satisfy my passion without actually being able to compete in the cage or in the ring." You know, I've got Dana to thank for that. Really, Dana and Lorenzo were the ones that presented me with the opportunity to uh, step into a commentary role, and you know, if it wasn't for that, I, I don't really know what I would have done. You know, to be honest, right before uh, I had my my two wins that got me back on track against uh, Ludwig and Sadala, I, I was already I was on a four fight losing streak anyway. So I was probably more ready to step away then than I was after the two wins. I was thinking about you know going back and studying and stuff, but after those two wins, it kind of it, it got me fired back up again and and you know back in love with the sport. So I, spoke, I, felt, I felt quite lost for a short period of time, but with the opportunity to commentate and you know be an ambassador for, for the UFC in Europe, it gave me something to focus on, and you know I, I attacked it like I would do a training camp. Uh, you know, took it very seriously. Same as with you know the shows that we developed, like Inside the Octagon and you know, UFC Breakdown Show and stuff. Like I just I thoroughly enjoyed the process of of creating something and and exploring what else I can do in the sport, to be honest. You know, I did a refereeing and judging course and um, I've, I've now commentated. I think the only thing I've not done yet is uh, ring announce. That's that's the last thing on the list to do now. But, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get there maybe. We'll get there. Yeah, it's kind of fascinating. I always look to see what fighters do you know, post their their combat career, how they kind of venture, do they stay in the sport? Do they do other things? And, you know, you were kind of almost forced into a situation where you had to kind of figure it out. And of course, like you said, you got the opportunities, but my God, did you take advantage of them? You have become one of the, the, the best analysts in the game. You've got so much experience when it comes to commentary behind the scenes. Of course, we're going to get to the head of fire operations for, for PFL Europe. But one last thing on your health, like you said, you're 41. 
for, for a long period there of the last couple of years, you know, the the appetite to to compete one more time, whether it be in the cage, in, in mixed martial arts or boxing, it just keeps surfacing. And I'm just wondering right now, as we're talking, is that still something that you would like to explore and, and maybe get one more fight before it's all said and done? Or are you completely closed with that chapter of your life? You, you know, I can't imagine a day when that would be completely closed, to be honest. I had a couple of boxing matches booked for last, last year, but you know, the, the event was postponed and then the, the whole fight was cancelled. So I kind of took that as a sign to like, you know, take a back seat and focus on Veronica's training camps. Obviously, she, you know, she had a successful fight in March. Um, you know, so I, I was kind of in a state where I was like, I was ready to kind of step back a little bit and, and settle more into the, the periphery roles around MMA. But then, you know, recently I know someone's been asking to fight me on on a, the PFL pay-per-view. So We'll see. I, I mean, I, I love the adrenaline rush. I love the idea of of being single minded, you know, wholeheartedly focused on one person in a training camp. I never really got that closure. And to be honest, yeah, I mean, you you know, you say 41. It, in my head, that's still the age of, that my dad is. You know, I remember when my dad turned 41, <laughs> which is kind of crazy. You know, my parents had me when they were young. I remember when my dad turned 41. So in my head, 41 is still my parents' age. And and, in, and I'm still like 23, 24 in my head. I don't really up, honestly feel any different. You know, I, it takes me maybe 15 more minutes to warm up a, 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 on a day. But uh, aside from that, I, I still feel good. So we'll see what happens. We'll see what the future holds. I certainly wouldn't turn away the opportunity if it was the right one, though. You mentioned they obviously, you know, coaching your, your other half, Veronica. Is there is there anything that allows you to kind of get some of that out through coaching her and through coaching other fighters as well? No, I, honestly, I think it makes it worse. It, it, <laughs> it's it's better because she's a better martial artist and a better student than I was. Um, that that really makes things a lot easier. I mean, she's a she's an incredible athlete. She listens well. She learns very very quickly. Um, so she she's covering ground that i i was not able to cover even in, in my 20s um the, the thing is it's frustrating because i still feel like i want to get in there and test some things myself because like kind of similar to Dwayne ludwig actually you know the, i always admired uh, ludwig's career it was always bittersweet when, when we fought and then you know he went on to become a, a really fantastic coach but a lot of his fighters do things that he never really did too much in his career you know what I mean? It's like they like he took what he knew and leveled it up and taught it them. And then they went in there and did it. And, and I feel very much in the same situation. Like I I was never in a position where I could put into practice the things that I know now because, you know, I didn't know them when I was, you know, when I was competing consistently. So, that, you know, there is a an excitement in passing that information on and seeing, you know, good fighters, good martial artists and good athletes do do things with it. But at the same time, I still want to kind of get in there and, and test it myself. Well, God bless. If you do make a comeback, uh, it'll be something that will be talked about because I, I can't even think of anyone that's taken, you know, uh, you know, forced upon them to be out of you know active competition for a decade uh, and then make a comeback, whether it's in a, in a in a cage, a ring, whatever the case may be. So do keep us posted on that. Um, you have had an incredible 2023 and i haven't had a chance to, like i said to speak to you about this personally as of yet but first of all congratulations on the gig with pfl europe like i said you are the head of fighter operations for pfl europe could you um share how this opportunity presented itself and what it was about the gig that made you commit to it um, well, I've been in contact with the PFL quite consistently over the last, you know, uh, uh, several months, you know, a couple of years, perhaps. Um, and George Greenberg initially wanted to bring me in to work on the the broadcasting side of it. Um, he wanted to integrate my analysis into the show somehow. You know, PFL is very big on the smart cade and the statistics and the strike speed and stuff. So adding a, a diff different layer of analysis uh, in, in there was the initial plan. So. I, I signed a deal with with the PFL to cover all of the events, PFL Europe as well as the global events. And then early in early this year, um, the idea was presented to me if I would be interested to, you know, kind of take control of the European roster, and you know, build a team of people within PFL Europe that are going to be able to 
run these shows and find these fighters and look after them, integrate them into the PFL system. And, you know, uh, and the fun part for me is I, I get to go out there and find these talented fighters that, that uh, you know, have either not been found yet or, you know, they've been found in their local region and we, we need to give them a world stage. And, you know, there's, there's just so much talent out there right now that it, it's, it, it plugs me right into the grassroots, into the amateurs that are coming through. But at the same time, you know, I'm working on the, the the global events where the world champions are fighting, and um, you know, and, and other exciting projects that are coming my way as well. It's I'm right across the sport from top to bottom. I feel, and that is, you know, I, I feel very privileged to be in this position. To be honest, yeah, it's incredible. Uh, how how would you say the PFL Europe promotion fits into the European landscape. Obviously, there's so many promotions, KSW, Cage Warriors, Octagon. You've got Bellator and the UFC also bringing shows to Europe multiple times a year. What would you say is the value proposition when you're trying to get a fighter to sign with the PFL to fight on these European shows? What is that, VP? Well, I mean, there are a couple of things. I think I think one is, is that the path being laid out ahead of them, you know, from being a European champion to a world champion to a pay-per-view star, you know, the, all, all those levels are available through the PFL now. Um, the other thing as well is the consistency of competition. It, it's something that's more problematic now for fighters than it was when I was a young fighter, which is crazy because, you know, back in the day, it was, it was, it was the wild West in comparison, but now there are so many gyms and so many fighters that there are not enough shows to cater for them all. Um, the, the shows that you mentioned, they're all fantastic events, you know, Cage Warriors and KSW, Octagon, Aries, you know, there, there are loads and loads of shows across Europe that are doing really good things. And of course, when, when the UFC comes over there, they're amazing events as well, like the last one in, in London uh, was was a, a, an incredible event. But they are, you know, they're kind of sporadic. There's not really a consistency to them. And I think what PFL offers is, you know, especially for the fighters involved in the regular season at the start of the year, they know that if they keep winning, they've got three fights that year, they've got $100,000 to win at the end of it, and they'll be the European champion. And that potentially opens the door for them to move on to the global roster where, you know, they can they can get in that million-dollar striking distance. It, it, it's a quick and easy path to, to making proper money in, in, in MMA, which has always been a rare thing. Um, and I think offering that money gives people a different opportunity and an option, which is going to, across the sport, push all the purses up, which I think is is additionally beneficial. I mean, you know, you can imagine if you're a, a budding heavyweight and you're looking at the options, you know, Ngannou's opponent's going to get $2 million. You're, going, you're starting to think of your options now. It's uh, it, it changes the market slightly, in my opinion. Yeah, you've got two events under your belt already this year, Newcastle and Berlin. Retrospectively, looking back at those events, how did they go for you and the brand? Well, you know, they were both fantastic events. I, I, you know, one was better than the next as well. You know, we we improved between Newcastle and Berlin. Um, I mean, the, the truth is I didn't really have a great deal to do with the Newcastle event aside from coming in on fight week and, you know, kind of watching the fighter ops team and how they integrate the fighters during fight week, trying to learn that job at the same time as commentating. Um, I really kind of started to take some control for the the Berlin event, uh, you know, doing some of the matchmaking, signing some of the fighters, and then obviously commentating the event as well. Um, I, I'm very happy with both of them. I, I think we've, we've already established ourselves within Europe as something to look forward to, you know, something that fighters can be excited about in the future, as well as, um, as well as some of the other big events that, that we get across in Europe. And then we're moving on to Paris, you know, we're, we're in our third event. We're already at a position where we don't need to worry about ticket sales, which is incredible. We've got Cedric Dumbe in the headliner on the card. We've got amazing playoff fights between some of the best prospects across the weight classes in Europe. In my opinion, We've got, I mean, the bantam weights in particular is the weight class that I'm keeping my eye on. We, we've got absolute killers in that weight class that uh, that any one of them could be in, in Ireland in 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 December taking that hundred thousand. Um, so I'm just excited to be honest. And before that, I've got three events over in the US to do as well. We've got San Antonio and then the two New York shows and Diaz, Jake Paul. So. You know the schedule's full and and it's all great stuff. I, I'm look for, looking forward to every bit of it. 
yeah, you just given me so much to chew on there. I mean, like you said, <laughs> you know, the, the you know, I worked for the PFL for a year, so I know the company, the promotion really, really well. It the stakes just rise after that regular season because you know when you're in the playoffs, you're like just one fight away from championship and and a championship belt and and the big money, um, you know, and especially with these venues, you know, Paris and Dublin, like they're going to be incredibly electric crowds. I'm really excited to see what these events actually uh, look like when they actually, you know, you know, come together. But as you mentioned there, so you're a little bit more hands-on now between Newcastle and Berlin as you kind of roll into the second half of the year, yeah? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I've actually been sending some contracts out today ready for the Paris card, uh, getting some of those fights matched. So I'm learning the system. You know, I've got a great team around me with, the, you know, Eduardo Lima and Greg Savage. Uh, of course, Ray Cefo helping me out and, and helping me understand the system, you know, behind the scenes because this is a, a, you know, a new a new area of, of, the, of the sport to me. But um, yeah, signed a few fighters today ready for fights and very excited to start announcing some of these bouts in the near future. It must be incredible for you as well to have joined the promotion at the same time, you have Jake Paul, the ultimate disruptor in combat sports, coming on board <laughs> as an investor. And then you have the baddest man on the planet in France, Zinganu, signed with the promotion as well. When this is all going on, are you thinking to yourself, have I just like joined the brand and the promotion at the perfect time? Because they are doing some incredibly big things this year. It does feel like that, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Even from, you know, from within, I'm watching some of these moves happening and, you know, hearing rumors of other things that are going on in the background and thinking to myself, you know, in six months time, the the, the MMA combat sports landscape is going to look very different. Um, and I'm I'm just excited to kind of be along for the ride, to be honest. I mean, you you, you mentioned the big hitters there with, you know, Ingano and Jake Paul. They're the ones that really drive the attention and they're both, over over with the PFL now, you know, got big things coming up in the boxing world as well, which is always going to help, uh, you know, uh, sp uh, spread the PFL brand across combat sports a bit more. It's all exciting stuff. Uh, and it's a wild time to be a combat sports fan. And I am first and foremost a combat sports fan. <laughs> Yeah, look, you know, I think you can make a very good case that although Francis Ngannou, fantastic signing, Jake Paul, a fantastic acquisition along with yourself, I think low-key, when you're thinking long-term, building a promotion around a particular fight, you can make a very, very strong case that Cedric Dumbe may be the biggest signing of the year. Incredible incredible kickboxing background, 4-0 and in MMA. That acquisition alone must have got you excited, especially to now utilize his debut for the Paris show. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you know, just the excitement of the rumor of Cedric uh, being on the Paris card was selling tickets. It, it, of course, he's a you know a very dynamic striker, very well known. What I mean, what, what is it? Seventy five and seven his record. It's it's incredible. And now he's crossed over to MMA, and he's he's still young in his MMA career. We still need to see if he's going to adapt to MMA as well as as well as he thinks he is. I mean, I interviewed him a few a few days ago and he is supremely confident that the whole standard across the world to a division worldwide is is it, it, within his capability to beat. And I, and I love that confidence, but of course MMA is a different sport and and we're going to see him against someone that can, you know, potentially put him on his back and uh, and beat him up. And uh, and that's, you know, that's what MMA is all about, you know, testing these other facets of a of a superstar kickboxer's game, um, but of course, you know, a very very exciting signing. And then you know, you look at you know, a bit further down the card. You know, we've got um, you know Simeon Powell undefeated, Dakota Ditchover undefeated, and I've got to give a shout out to Lewis McGrillan as well. He's not going to be on the Paris card. Um, he'll have his third run out in uh, in Newcastle. But I mean, you know, what a superstar! First round knockout Newcastle, second round knockout in in Berlin. I had to find someone that was, you know, was going to be able to take one of his punches. And I, I think we found someone that could do it for, you know, the best part of five minutes. But um, what an incredible talent that kid is. Definitely one to watch. Yeah, what I love about the Cedric signing is he's a fighter that the promotion can really build around as a homegrown, a PFL through and through fighter, very much like Kayla, when Kayla Harrison was signed with the promotion in the US. You think of Kayla Harrison, you think of the PFL. Um, in this kind of role, what have you 
learned about the industry that perhaps you weren't aware of or didn't know beforehand? Hmm. That's a that's a good question. I I would say you know the the interest in the difference between fighters self value in in the sport. <laughs> that's a that's a very interesting one because there are some fighters that have got absolutely no reason to think that they're worth so much money, and then other fighters that are you know begging to be on cards for no money at all because they want to be active, and, and partly because no one wants to fight them for any money at all. It's uh, it's a very interesting, you know, spectrum to be honest. But yeah, there there are some fighters out there that, you know, you 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 uh, show some interest in them, and immediately they're 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 six figures into their demands, and <laughs> and you're like, I mean, the, you know, one of the first things I do is, of course, I look I look through who they fought, and that gives me a good idea of what value I would put on that fighter, but like. I don't know. I, I I I think I mean things have changed a lot since since I was fighting. I mean, my first couple of fights, I was like hundred pounds, hundred and fifty pounds. Like we were taking fights for free just to stay active and get experience. It seems now like people they they don't want to to step outside of their comfort zone unless they're being heavily compensated for it. Sometimes, and that's that's not a healthy place to be for for a young athlete. They they need to be willing to get their you know get their feet wet and uh, and take some challenges on. Um, but yeah, it's you know it's all a part of of learning the the, the role and and the job, and unfortunately for these fighters, it, you know if they're being too demanding, I, I can always give them a little breakdown of their last fight and explain to them, you know, <laughs> why the offer is is as reasonable as it is. <laughs> well, speaking of breakdowns, that's a perfect segue into what I want to speak to you about next because like I said you are one of the best analysts in the game you know we are both I guess kind of sort of colleagues at TNT Sports previously BT Sport I work behind the scenes in social media you obviously have the Dan Hardy breakdown show when did you know that you were good at breaking down film providing analysis but 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 then doing so at a very high level on camera and and explaining it so that if you're a hardcore fan, you're getting something from it. If you're a casual fan and you want to be a little more invested, you're going to get something out of this too. When did you know that you were good at this? I don't know, to be honest. I just kind of, I was doing it and then people started telling me that, that you know, what I was saying was making sense. And I've just taken people's word for it, you know. <laughs> like Sean O'Connell a few weeks ago, he was saying that, the reason why he likes my breakdowns is because I'm able to explain things that his grandma would understand and she doesn't watch MMA at all. Um, you know, that that to me is is really important because the main role that I have in the sport, aside from everything, is to educate people about the sport so they appreciate it more. You know, like a good example is uh, the main event in Berlin, Francesco Nuzzi. I was talking a few minutes before he his fight started about how he sets his head kick up with his left hand, just like Leon Edwards did perfectly against Usman. You know, it's a beautiful technique. It's not at all accidental. And, you know, I broke it down and then it happens in the fight following. He, he uses the same technique again. And and for me, that's a good it's a good opportunity for me to to help people understand it's not accidental. Right. You know, there are a lot of people that watch these things and they're just going, oh, these guys are just throwing whatever at one another. Whatever they were working on pads that week at Thai boxing, they're just throwing it and whatever lands, lands. And there's a lot more complexity to it, which, which you know, I feel is important to get across. And the higher the fight IQ of the fans, the, the more appreciation that these fighters are going to get for not only what they're doing, but how they're doing it. Um, I, I just love the process. And, and to be honest, sometimes when I watch somebody else trying to do it and struggling, then I go, okay, I, I, I see now, I, I, I see now what people mean, but it's more just because of the way that my brain works. You know, I, I, I just kind of, I, I absorb the fighters like a bit like Shang Tsung off, uh, off Mortal Kombat. I absorb a little bit of their, of their essence and then I battle it out in my head. And, and I just kind of, I, I talk people through what I'm seeing and what I'm feeling about the fight. And my picks aren't always right, but I often feel like I have the, the main facets of the fighters, uh, you know, well laid out, which helps people understand what to expect. 
Yeah, these aren't flimsy five, 10 minute breakdowns. Some of these breakdowns are 45 minutes, 50 minutes, an <laughs> hour long. They're, they're incredibly detailed. And you mentioned the process there. What is that process like for you? How much time are you dedicating uh, to making sure that these breakdowns are as detailed as possible? And what is that process like for you? Well, I mean, the B, the BT or rather TNT sports breakdown um, is that that's that's an interesting process. And that process was kind of developed uh, during the inside the octagon days. You know, that was that that kind of that process kind of developed itself, to be honest, based on what what I needed for the show. I couldn't edit videos at the time. So I would watch the videos through and get the time codes of off the clock in the corner of, OK, I need this clip from this round and this clip and then I would sit with an editor for a day and we'll go through and grab all the clips and I'd build the playlists. Um, now I do it myself. I, I just, I, I, I get the videos, I download all, all the, all the tape that I need and uh, edit the clips together myself so I can get the exact moments that I want and edit them together in a sequence where I can explain my point. Um, and then, you know, for, for, for the, for the, the breakdown show, I mean, what, what do I do? I, I, I tend to have, I aim for six one minute playlists. That's that's always my goal. But the challenge is often to cut it down below eight minutes. And you say my breakdowns, I mean, honestly, like I, I could a 45 minute breakdown is me being succinct. Like one day what I would like to do is to do a, a no holds barred all out, you know, especially if the fight's big enough. Like if we ever get a John Jones, Francis and Garnu. I, I could do a two hour live show on that breakdown. No, no doubt about it. And, and I, I don't think people quite realize that, you know, I mean, so I, 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 I edit the playlist, I send them off to BT and they, they replicate the playlist for me in high resolution and send them back. And then I put them in my iPad and I just sit and the, the breakdown show is, is a, is a one shot recording. Almost always we, we just kind of sit there and, I just work through it and I, as I'm talking through, I'm recording what I'm doing on my iPad with the animation and then I take that and send it over and that's edited into the show. So what you're seeing animated is actually what I'm what I'm doing on my iPad when I'm uh, when I'm talking. Um, it's just a it, it's it's just quite a natural process for me now and I enjoy it. But but it, it does it does get to the stage where after two or three days of research, I feel I feel like physically heavy with the information. So it's like an exorcism to record the show. <laughs> and do you ever have fighters come up to you after the fact saying, hey, your breakdown really helped me with a fight or hey, or on the other side, hey, Dan, can you stop giving away all the secrets? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had Max Holloway say that to me once. Um, I, I, I just interviewed him for uh, for BT Sport in Vegas. And, and as he got up, he was taking his mic off and he went, oh, and hey, stop giving away all my, sec my secrets. Yeah, you know, I do. I, I know that. I, I know that. Um, I, I know that that quite a few fighters do watch it. I've had coaches compliment me as well on it. You know, Mark Henry is probably my favourite. Um, uh, th there was a, a particular fight, a particular moment where he came up to me afterwards, and he was like, "That we we, we were looking at it in the dressing room as we were warming up. We said this and blah blah blah." You know, those moments make me realize that I'm what I'm saying is is making some sense to even the the, the most elite of people. Um, and then, you know, the other thing I've had a, quite a few fighters reach out and ask me, you know, like ask me if I, I can <laughs> if they can hire me to break my break their opponent down. Um, and obviously, when I was working for the UFC, I, I could never do that because it was a a conflict of interest. But but now I'm I'm available for it. These these things are. I'm certainly open to, but it would all be entirely confidential, you know. So there might be some fighters getting breakdowns right now that uh, that I can't tell you about. <laughs> I love it. It's great to be a free agent, I guess, and have the flexibility to kind of, you know, have your finger in many pies, so to speak. Um, you mentioned earlier on Sean O'Connell, uh, you know, one of the nicest guys in the sport, and also when you want to talk about a PFL ambassador, he is the man. He went through the system, became the champion, won a million dollars, obviously doing fantastic work on the broadcast. I've had the pleasure of working with him a little bit behind the scenes as well. You two have a show uh, for The Zone, MMA, Social, Digital. What's that like working with Sean and creating that content? Oh, it's, it's awesome. You know, honestly, every time I work with, with Sean, he impresses me more and more. And I have told him this as well. I mean, the job that he does as play-by-play -play is very difficult. People often get confused about, you know, the differences between the roles. And, you know, I'm, I'm an analyst. I'm a color commentator. 
So like I don't have any responsibility of like holding the show together. All the chaos that comes through in our earpieces, that's for Sean to deal with most of the time. So, you know, it's a very, very difficult job to do. John Anik does an incredible job, but but Sean for me is is equally as talented and as skilled. And um the, just he he has a different manner about him. I mean, you know, like Anik's got a very kind of intense, very excited, this is a big moment, etc. No matter what's going on, Sean is able to surf it like a like a like someone on vacation in Hawaii. You know what I mean? It's just he's got this cool, calm. He's able to carry it no matter what. It, it's very, very impressive what he does, a- and he's hilarious. You know, I wish some more of his comedy would come across on the broadcast. But um, he's he is a very, very funny and talented man. It's it's really good to work work alongside him and the Dazone podcast as well. With this, it's a you know, it's a developing show. We're having a lot of fun building it. With all these things that you're doing, Dan, and all the you know various hats that you wear, do you have a gig that you would say that's my favorite thing to do, or that's the one that I really look forward to the most? How how would you rank all the different jobs and gigs that you have right now? Yeah, I, I don't I don't really separate them to be honest. It's just MMA. I just I just work I just work in MMA for MMA. Um, all of my day is spent thinking about MMA, talking about it, you know, assessing fighters, talking to fighters, training. You know, it, it's it, I, I love it. I don't really separate it out too much. I, I love the the days when I when I know I can block out three days and tell everyone to leave me alone because I'm breaking this fight down and nothing is more important right now than these two fighters and me understanding how this is going to play out. Um, I don't get those days as often as I used to, but when when one of the BT Sport, the, the, the TNT breakdown shows come around, I do tend to block out a good two days and clear my schedule and make sure I can fully immerse myself because I, I watch their whole back catalogue and I watch it on repeat and I watch it slow down and I've got my punch counters, so I'm counting the significant strikes in my opinion and like it gets, I can get a little bit crazy about it, but I but I love those moments where I can be be obsessive about about one particular matchup they're probably my favorite things to do amazing well look dan you've got so many things on your plate i love to see it you're thriving before i let you go though listen if you want to see dan's breakdown content they're like i said they're like 40 50 minutes an hour long go to the tnt sport youtube channel but i'd love to get your thoughts on two particular fights at the end of this year just your general idea of the fight itself Maybe a prediction if you want to give it. Francis Ngannou versus Tyson Fury in a boxing ring. Everyone I speak to just says, listen, it's just heavyweights. And it's it's can you get, you know, can Francis Ngannou land that one punch knockout? But is does he have another path to defeating Fury? How how do you break that fright? You know, that, how do you break that fight down outside of just like, okay, Francis, all he needs to do is land that one punch? Well, I mean, you know, he's got to think about accumulation. You know, it's not as easy as landing one clean punch against someone that can take a shot from Deontay Wilder and sit up like The Undertaker. Like, he, he has to do something a bit smarter than that. And, of course, he has terrifying power, but he can't assume that that's going to be enough to win in the fight. He, he has to be quite strategic about how he lands it. I mean, I know he's going to be working with, with Mike Tyson, which I think is smart, but I hope it's a lot of work and I hope it's good quality work. Even with Rafael Cordero, who holds pads for Tyson, you know, getting him to kind of replicate that that peekaboo side to side body movement, and and also educating him about searching for the body a bit more. You know, that power transfers. It doesn't have to be a headshot. It can be, it can be to the even what Canelo does so well. You know, working his opponent's arms and and shoulders and and uh, you know biceps, triceps, forearms, all the swelling that he can he creates around his opponent's arms could be something that. Ngannou could use very well and bringing down the arms beating up the body is the easiest way to expose the head he's going to have to do something to get a clean shot and and it's not going to be as easy as just wading his way in there through the jab and trying to land something it's got to be a a more strategic approach to that otherwise he's going to be way way out of his depth which is what anybody with a logical box in mind is going to be able to see Um, but I I can't underestimate Francis Ngannou He's, he's a he's a man of um, of of uh, supreme determination, I think is a good way of putting it. And if he puts the right work in between now and then, 
there's no reason why you can't land the significant shots to do the damage. You know, one more thing about Francis that I didn't get a chance to to ask you earlier on. As you mentioned, back in the day, you're fighting for free. You're 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 fighting for a hundred, you know, two hundred pounds. To see someone like Francis, you know, back himself the way he did, um, become a free agent against all the odds to to work through the the, the politics of this, this sport to get what he wanted. What what's that like for for you, just as an observer more than anything else, to see the evolution of the sport in and the industry? And also, do you think this is just a unicorn moment? Do you think we might see things like this happen again down the road? I think it's certainly significant given the fact that he's the heavyweight champion. I mean, that's going to be a very rare occurrence when the heavyweight champ is a free agent. Um, but certainly it's going to give other fighters in other weight classes confidence to step out. I mean, you know, it was a huge moment for him to, you know, to take that leap and and to back himself, as you said. Um I mean, anybody making that kind of money from combat sports. When I was first starting out back in the early two thousands, that was that was just a wild thought. I mean, even you know, even boxers weren't making the kind of money that he's making now. Um, so it's it's uh, you know it's an exciting time, and and I do think it's a very unique situation, uh, given the fact that he was the heavyweight champion. But I also do think it will give a lot of other fighters confidence that there is a safety net out there to catch them if they decide to take that leap. Um, and, you know, only one way I guess the whole situation could have been improved is if, you know, some of the other UFC champions would have stood alongside Ngannou for what he was what he was standing for, because they could have actually really changed the sport of mixed martial arts for the better. Um, but, you know, one man alone can't do it. You know, he can only determine his own fate. He would have needed the support of a few of the other champions. And uh, unfortunately, they were too busy signing new contracts from what I can tell. Well, he's also um, a fighter representative. You you never had a fighter representative, you know, on that board level, you know, when you were fighting for, for the UFC. Um, how important do you think that could be long term, you know, even when his fighting career is done? You know, it's going to be essential long term. The the sport will will need those people in those particular roles. They, they've got it across other sports. The majority of other sports have have gone through this process in the past. I mean, you know, given the, the infancy of mixed martial arts, we've got to give it some time to to get to these stages. Um, that you know, the likes of uh, professional football and baseball have uh, have gone through. You know, professional basketball, same. We, we'll get to the stage where we've got fighter representatives and and you know we've got more uh you know united uh um what's the best way of putting it yeah a, a, a more united front for the fighters uh, you know against the promotions hoarding all the money because like we're you know ultimately the people that are taking the risks are the ones that are, are making the least amount of money and just for the health of mixed martial arts we want those people to then move on to jobs within the sport where they can open gyms and learn to be referees and judges and, uh, and whatever else. We want those people to be around to invest back in the sport and also to invest in themselves to make sure that they're fit and healthy and making the most of their retired life after they've sacrificed so much to entertain us. Um, but I think we will get there. It's just a, a process and MMA is still very young. Yeah, absolutely. One byproduct of Francis joining the PFL is, uh, unfortunately, we're not going to get Francis Ngannou versus John Jones. But there was a fantastic tease at a recent PFL event where, the, where those two, you know, w went face to face. Uh, and like I said, it's unfortunate we're not going to get it. Uh, who knows? Maybe things change down the road in the future. Let's see what happens. But John Jones is going to compete again later on this year um, on a massive show for the UFC, the 30th anniversary show against Stipe Miocic. I guess it's being billed as GOAT versus GOAT. Uh, and so my final question to you, Dan, is if you could give me your thoughts on that fight, you know, with Stipe being out for such a long time you know, at his age against arguably the greatest of all time, does he stand a chance? Can he get this victory? How do you see that fight playing out? You know, I honestly think it's it's going to be a, a real uphill battle for Stipe. You know, I, I don't think he has the advantages, especially the ones that he used to have a few years ago, where he's got movement on his side. You know, he, he's mobile, he's quick. I, I think a lot of these these skills are, are going to be, you know, they're going to look more arduous than they did previously. And I think John Jones, even you know, gaining a little bit of weight, is going to look a lot smoother and slicker in there. 
Um, I, I would imagine John Jones is going to have a reach advantage as well, which he's going to make the most of. And the, the downside with Stipe's style, I think, ultimately, is that he does stand heavy on his back foot. And Jones is so good at pushing people back that he might find himself being pushed off balance and have and his back up against the fence. And then if he finds himself there, you know, I think we're going to get a combination of John Jones level changing and wrestling against the fence with the Jones that we saw against Rashad Evans, where, you know, he was just locking horns and, and smashing with elbows. It, it could be a real, you know, a, a, a real one-sided fight in John Jones's favor. I think Stipe is going to have to be very smart with his boxing on the inside and even wrestle offensively to force John Jones to work more than he wants to and, you know, test that heavyweight frame out, see see where his, uh, his conditioning lands. Um, but I, I expect it to be a very, very tough fight for Stipe. And and I think John Jones is going to be, look, be looking even more impressive than he did in his last fight, to be honest. Well, I can't wait for that fight. I can't wait for Francis Fury. I can't wait for PFL Europe in the second half of the year. Dan, it's, it's so great to catch up with you. I'm so genuinely happy to see you flourishing in so many aspects of the sport and the industry you know good luck with coaching veronica good luck with pfl europe uh, i'll be obviously you know looking forward to all the tnt sport breakdowns good luck with the zone mma you got a lot going on like i said i'm extremely happy for you and i really appreciate you coming on the show this week thank you very much my friend it's always great to talk to you we, we've left it far too long we'll have to catch up again much we won't leave, next time. we won't we won't leave it this long next time 100 percent Take care, Dan. Speak to you soon. Thanks. Thanks for listening to this episode of Smack Talk with Sandu. It really means a lot to me. And hey, listen, if you enjoyed this episode, please go and give it a follow on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your shows.